All right, guys, in this episode, we're going to be talking about, I think, one of the most difficult subjects to discuss in bonsai art and horticulture, and that is the subject of watering. Now, I've been avoiding doing a video on this since we started Bonsai U, simply because it's such a difficult thing to discuss and a difficult thing to teach. But after so many requests from you guys out there on the platform and from hearing so many requests from my intensive students here at the nursery, I figured at some point, we needed to get into this subject and why not go ahead and do it right now in the dead heat of the summer on one of the hottest days of the year so far. We're pushing 100 degrees Fahrenheit today, about 40 degrees Celsius. So it's a perfect opportunity to actually discuss this issue. So the reason that watering is so difficult to talk about is because every species is different. Every day is different. Every climate that you operate in is going to be different. And, you know, for example, you could have the same genetically identical plants. You could have, say, five or six of them side by side. You could have five trident maples that are propagated from the same parent plant via cuttings or air layers. You could have five junipers. You could have five black pines. They're all going to dry out at different rates during each day based on the weather, based on where they're located within a garden relative to shade, based on whether or not the plant is sick relative to another plant sitting right next to it. So all of these things have to be taken into consideration. I remember my first day as an apprentice at Fujikawa Kokan Nursery in Osaka way back in May of 20, what was it, 2008 actually, long, long time ago. I walked into the nursery, Fujikawa-san handed me a hose and he said, I'm going to teach you how to water today, but you're not really going to master this until you're here for at least three years. And I laughed at the time. I thought it was kind of a silly thing to say, but it actually turned out to be quite correct. Now, this isn't to scare you guys or discourage you when it comes to watering. It's just to emphasize that this is a difficult thing to learn. And it's going to be, I think, difficult for me to show you in a video, but I'm going to try my best. So without further ado, let's dive into the topic of watering. So first and foremost here, before we even pick up a hose and start watering our trees, we need to assess some key elements about the plants that we're working with because that's going to impact how we actually approach watering later in this episode. So the first thing I want you guys to take into consideration is the evolutionary background of the species that you're working with. So in other words, where does the tree come from originally in nature? So this is going to be assessing things like the elevation where the tree comes from or the latitude where the tree originates. These things will affect climate. Let's say if you're closer to the coast, you might end up with a kind of microclimate, even if it's at a high elevation, for example. If you're more inland at a high elevation, say like in Colorado, you're going to have very limited rainfall. You're going to have a lot of sun, but it's not going to necessarily be very hot at that elevation. And you may not have much rainfall, as I mentioned before, so the trees might want to stay a little bit on the the drier side. So you need to assess this when it comes to a given species and then you need to take that information and look at your climate in your given area. So if you're taking a tree from high elevation with very little rainfall, bringing it down to a lower elevation area where you've got way more humidity in the air, way more rainfall, you might need to adjust how you water. And this could be in terms of how many times per day that you water, whether or not you keep the tree in shade, whether or not you keep the tree out of direct rain on occasion. If, for example, in the summer you have a rainy season in your given climate, you might have to shelter the tree, for example. So definitely take a look at where the trees come from and then assess how to treat the root system of the plants when it comes to watering. One great example that I like to give is in Japan, if we look at say Hinoki cypress, for example, Hinokis tend to grow in groves at kind of medium elevation. Now these groves end up creating a full canopy at the top that then shades out the understory and it creates a very sort of cool and moist environment for the root systems of those plants. So in bonsai horticulture, what this means is that we need to not only protect the root systems from direct sunlight in the hottest part of summer, but we also need to keep the roots relatively moist on Hinoki cypress. In contrast to that, if we look at something like a Japanese white pine that is growing at a high elevation, say in the Fukushima area of Japan, there's much less rainfall in that area. These trees are typically much lower because they're getting whipped around by the wind. So there's not a big broad canopy that's creating that cool understory for the roots. So essentially with the Japanese white pines on their own rootstock, we need to make sure that we're chronically underwatering those plants because if we overwater them, you can end up with root rot issues. 
So what I recommend is if you're dealing with plant species that are either exotic from Japan or Asia or native plants in your area, always look at the original sort of evolutionary background of the plant, the original climate where those plants grew, and then make adjustments from there. Now there are some species that are going to be a bit anomalous when it comes to taking them from their original environment and bringing them to a new environment and then responding better in that new environment than they did in their original environment. So let's take this one seed juniper right beside me here as an example. This tree is a desert plant. It was collected out in the high elevation deserts of New Mexico at about 4,500 feet. And there's very little rainfall out in that area and very little humidity. But when we bring it to Nashville, where we have regularly 80, 90% humidity and temperatures pushing, you know, upper 90s near 100, so 37, 38, 40 degrees Celsius. When we bring it to an environment like this with the humidity here, these guys actually thrive. They throw on tons of growth. And if we keep the root systems relatively moist, like I would with any other juniper, like Itoigawa or Kishu or even Rocky Mountain junipers, they actually thrive in this environment here. So you can take a plant in some instances from an environment where it's barely surviving because of the elements and bring it to an environment where we start watering it more frequently. We miss the foliage, for example, and that tree will begin to thrive. So just because the evolutionary background of the plant says one thing doesn't mean that you can't adjust it and do something different to get better growth out of the plant. So some of this will come with experimentation, but I recommend that, again, you look at the original growing environment of that plant, use that as kind of a basis or a launching pad to decide how much water you should start out with with the plant, and then adjust from there based on the response of that particular species. So the next thing we want to take into consideration here is the stage of development of the plant that we're working with. So basically what that means is, is the tree in early stages of development? Is it in mid stages of development? Or has it moved more into the refinement stage where we're trying to sort of slow growth down? So if it's in early stages of development, this is where we're trying to build the primary structure of the tree, meaning the primary trunk line, the thickness of that trunk line, maybe taper within the trunk as well and also developing thickness within the primary branch structure of the tree. So in order to do that, we're gonna be using usually denser soil, we're going to be using more fertilizer on the plants, and typically we're gonna be watering these trees relatively frequently to make sure that they're never really fully drying out. So this is, again, to put on tons of growth on the plant, maybe even to create more back budding on trees, let's say with pines, for example, uh, single flush pines in particular. If we're trying to create back budding on those plants, we're not concerned about needle length. So tons of fertilizer, lots of water, making sure that the tree is staying somewhat moist, again, depending on the species, is going to aid in putting on more back budding on those plants. Whereas a tree like a single flush pine, let's say a Japanese white pine, for example, that's moved into the refinement stage, at that point, we're looking to reduce the needle size on the tree. So typically we're backing off on the water at that point to shorten the needle length. Now there are going to be limits to how much water you can back off to get the needles to shorten. If you do it too much, if you take too much water out of the equation, you can end up with branch dieback on your pine. So of course that's not a good idea. And if we're also dealing with something like deciduous plant material where you've got somewhat large leaves, backing off on the water can very easily kill those plants. So you've got to make sure that you're doing the right thing to the right species. So uh, when it comes to deciduous material, reducing water isn't going to necessarily reduce leaf size. It's probably going to actually damage the physical plant. So you're better off in those instances searching for deciduous material that already has a small leaf size on it. So this is where all of this gets very, very confusing very, very quickly. And we need to sort of assess each of these individual components. Uh, I'm trying my best here to sort of break these things down into categories for you guys to make it a little bit more of a simple process. But when it comes to watering, again, look at the stages of the development of the plant and then assess how to water from there. So the next big thing to take into consideration is the soil type that you're using. So soil type is also going to be influenced by the stage of development of the tree. So for example, plants that are in early stages of development, again, we're typically trying to put on a lot of tissue. So we usually put those plants in a very dense soil that has a very high CEC or cation exchange capacity, which is the ability for that soil to hold fertilizer and then release it back to the tree. 
So because it's a dense soil typically, it's gonna hold quite a bit of moisture. Now that being said, we're not looking to you know, let these trees dry out completely. We wanna keep them relatively moist, again, depending on the evolutionary background of the tree. But because the plants are in early stages of development, having them in that dense soil is a good idea. Whereas if you were to put plants in early development into our typical bonsai soil, like Akadama, Pumice, Lava, Rocky, and Kiryu in some sort of various ratio, you're going to end up having to water those plants much more frequently because they drain significantly faster if you wanna get the same amount of growth out of the plants. Now, if we shift over to trees that are in mid stages of development, this is when we typically move the plants over to a standard bonsai soil mix of Akadama, Pumice, Lava Rock, and Kiryu in various ratios, again, depending on the species. So Akadama is the most water retentive component of those four. Uh, pumice is going to be the second most water retentive. Then you're going to have Kiryu, which is very free draining. It's basically a river sand. Uh, and then the last component is lava rock, which is typically put in to help uh, sort of retain the integrity of the soil as the other components break down over time. So the more of that latter component or those latter two components, the lava rock and the Kiryu that you add in, the freer draining the mix, the more frequently you're going to have to water. The more of the Akadama and pumice that you add in, the more water retentive it is, the less you're going to have to water. So again, you wanna base this on the species that you're working with. You wanna base it on the goal with the plant. Again, are you trying to put on back budding? Are you trying to slow the growth down? Are you trying to reduce needle size, foliage size, et cetera? And then you can adjust your watering from there. So you can see where all of these elements are starting to intersect here. And at these intersecting points, this is where we sort of come to figure out how much water, how frequently, how often we need to water a given plant in our gardens. Now, another thing that we need to take into consideration here is the foliar density of the tree. So the more foliage a plant has on it, the more it's transpiring in the hotter parts of the day and the faster the root system typically is going to dry out. Uh, this is true for conifers, deciduous and broadleaf evergreen trees. Now, when it comes to the different seasons here, if we're looking at, let's say the winter, for example, obviously deciduous trees have no foliage on them at that time of year, so they're not really transpiring at all. Whereas conifers and broadleaf evergreens will have foliage, so they're gonna dry out much more frequently during that time of year. But in general, just the idea that the more foliage you have on the plant, the faster it's going to dry out due to transpiration through the foliage. Now you also have to consider here too that trees that have big broad canopies on them where the canopy is actually covering the root system of the plant, when it rains, just because it rains doesn't mean that the roots are getting enough water. If it's a full on deluge with rain, you're probably okay, but it's still a good idea to check. If it's just a light rain, more than likely those trees will still be dry, maybe not on the surface, but the core of the root ball could be drying out and those trees probably still need to be watered. I remember during my apprenticeship at Fujikawa Sons Nursery, he would have us go out in the rain, in rain gear to actually water some of the trees that had those big broad canopies on them, particularly deciduous trees. And people would be driving by the nursery looking at us like we were insane out there with the hoses in rain gear while it's pouring down rain. But it made sense with those particular trees because the rains, particularly in the rainy season in the summer, may not be very heavy. So again, the root systems could be drying out even though everything else around on the benches has been soaked. So make sure you check your trees every single day, even if it's rained outside, just for safety's sake.